Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Cannabis Business Opportunity presented by Chiba Cannabis Academy, uh, Gibbs Business School, and Coop, who are an organization based uh, within the uh, University of Pretoria framework dealing with cannabis. I'd like to invite you all to this session. Today's session, we're going to focus very, very specifically on the business of cannabis. We're going to outline where the opportunities are. Um, some of you on this uh, webinar might be investors. Um, you might be people wanting to start small businesses. So we're really going to focus on the, the, the mainframe and the supply chain of the industry so we can establish where we need to grow, uh, where we're strong already, and how we can really bring this industry online because it's an exciting industry with huge potential, but we need a lot of work to bring it online to realize its full potential. Um, before we start, I'd like to bring in our guests. So guys, if you just want to unmute your mics and, and take your cameras off, I'll bring you into the room and we'll do a quick uh, run around the room. So Debojo, do you want to start? Just tell, people, tell, them, tell the nation who you are. <laughs> Thanks, Trenton. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tebo Hotropani. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Am I uh, audible? Good, super. Um, my name is Tebo Hotropani. I'm a founder of uh, Biomoti. Uh, Biomoti is a company founded with the basis of uh, allowing to provide natural based medicine to, um, to the public. I mean, as it is, um, the feeling is that there's not enough. Uh, natural medicine uh, uh, available within the, the space of uh, uh, your pharmacies and, and various other places. It's really, really more of your allopathic medication. And I think Biomotive's focus is to be able to create an environment where we can give um, uh, patients and customers the option to treat their ailments using natural medicine. And cannabis became a natural progression to that. And it's an amazing medicine we find. And research after research is showing the amazing potential that cannabis has as a medicine within the space that we are at. And it's not just South Africa, it's a global phenomenon. I think uh, the day when we discovered that cannabis is a medicine, it became a rush of understanding what it is. And we really owe this to some of the amazing professors in Tel Aviv University that actually have found this. And Biomoti, really, we've been around for the past four years, and our focus has always been making sure that we're making the best possible uh, for the public. Uh, we can be found in, 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 in the, uh, participating pharmacies, health stores, and, and pet stores. We also have a very wide range of, uh, of, of pet uh, 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 medicine. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the, 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 the panel in order to really unpack this opportunity. Uh, that South Africa has. Um, I think the feeling, and I think around in terms of the, um, all the colleagues and, 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 and competitors alike, the feeling is that there is, we, it seems that there is not really much of an agency within the, the government uh, concerned. And even the relations themselves, they seem to be not in line with what's going on internationally. And I think the, 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 the platform will allow us to unpack some of these challenges that are there. Um, and be able to really see if we can find a common ground and a way to move forward in a much more better, cohesive way. Thank you, Trenton. Thanks, Tabako. Uh, Brett, over to you. Hi, Trenton. Hi to everybody. Um, I come from an old school journalism, hard news background. Um, I cut my teeth at Prime Media at Radio 702, where I covered the Mandela uh, era and unbanning of the ANC. And... Uh, then went on to help launch Cape Talk Radio, uh, develop iAfrica.com's internet strategy um, before leaving the corporate world and uh, buying a, a sort of bricks and mortar souvenir publishing business, which I fortunately jettisoned uh, just before COVID. I relocated to Limpopo and the first opportunity that uh, came, well, that Cannabis Africa was a, is a breaking news and content service for the African emerging African legal cannabis market. And it was a, the ideal kind of business to emerge uh, from a covered environment. It was put together as a family business. My son, who's studying software engineering um, in, in Berlin, uh, helped me uh, conceptualize the, the, the templates and the format. And one of his uh, friends, uh, Manos Romano, helped build the, 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 the platform. And so we launched uh, a couple of months ago into an environment which is going very, very heavily online. And um, what has amazed me is the thirst for news that is out there. 
We've gone from having 2,500 uh, regular monthly users a, a month ago to close on 7,000 as of yesterday, and it's growing every day. So certainly, if you have a look at the media activity in this space, and really I'm reporting on the deals that are going on, the um, things that are happening in policy and legalization, you can already feel if the money's not quite there yet, the, certainly there's a lot of uh, underground or, or, or intense activity that's heading that way. And I think um, the, the, the cannabis... Uh, Boom is on its way, it's unstoppable, but that doesn't mean that there's uh, money to be made for everybody. Back to you, Trenton. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why we're here, to unpack, you know, is there money, where is the money, and what do we need to do? So thanks for that, Brett. Sibu uh, Siso, how's it? Quick introduction from you. Hi, Trenton, um, and welcome to everyone joining us uh, today. Um, uh, obviously, a big thank you to Chiba, um, Coop, and uh, Gordon Institute of Business Science for organizing. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Rusiso uh, Baba, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Africa Cannabis Advisory Group. Um, we're a services provider that works with a broad range of stakeholders in the industry, including governments, uh, corporates, entrepreneurs, uh, communities, and research institutions. Uh, and we specialize in the conceptualization or formulation of uh, cannabis strategies or plans, and then on the execution of, uh, of those plans. So we've got a very strong focus on strategy and strategy development, uh, on investor readiness and capital raising, um, on global sales uh, and distribution, uh, and on uh, brand uh, creation and, uh, and marketing. Uh, we've been around since uh, 2000 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 19. So thanks, thank you everyone. Great, thanks Hibs. Um, Pierre? Hello morning. everybody. Uh um, yeah, thanks to Gibbs Coop and, and obviously Chiva, thank you. Um, I see we've got 145 people online Yeah, that's a great audience. Um, my background is I come from the media industry, I'm a media entrepreneur, I was involved in starting some media brands you may know of ETB, YFM. Uh, a few years ago I got into the cannabis industry. Um, and I operate in various capacities. Probably the two that are relevant to this webinar is I'm a, the joint CEO of a cannabis focused fund where we raise capital called Silver Leaf Investments. Um, and we've recently, I've recently combined my consulting business with Schindler's and Sativios to form a new consulting company called the Greenhouse Project. Um, and we consult on all aspects of uh, the cannabis industry. We're trying to be a one-stop shop. So the lawyers handle the legal side, the pharmaceutical license side is handled by, handled by Sativius, who are experts in that field. And my area is really business readiness. So uh, that's very broad from business plans to sourcing suppliers. Um, and we're looking to work with all the leading players in the industry. Thanks, Trenton. Great, thanks, Pierre. Um, yeah, just uh, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Trent on Birch. <laughs> I head up Chiva Africa. Uh, we run Craft Cannabis TV as well as Africa's first cannabis educator called Chiba's, Chiba Cannabis Academy. What's really inspiring to hear about your backgrounds is that you know you guys are, are really serious people with serious business acumen, a lot of uh, under your belt. So it's uh, it's very inspiring to see such high caliber of, of personnel entering the industry, and I think that's what we need in order to move this forward. Um, I just want to give a quick intro in terms of the, the cannabis uh, opportunity, and I don't expect this to, to, uh, to be necessarily contextualized because uh, these numbers in isolation might not mean a lot. But um, there's, a, there's a global think tank called Prohibition Partners. They do a lot of research in the space. Um, if we look at the top there, by, by 2024, they reckon the industry will be $103 billion globally. Um, if you look at the, the, the one below, um, South Africa, you know, uh, Africa 7.1 billion by 2023 and uh, South Africa 27 billion rand. Um, the point of this is that there is a sizable opportunity globally for cannabis um, and something to be taken very, very seriously. And I think this is quite interesting. Uh, I don't know if this is a good or bad thing that uh, the prevalence of cannabis is higher in Africa than anywhere else, but it again shows you that there's a huge market opportunity. I mean, you know, all of that to, to pretty much it will be illegal at the moment, but the opportunity to move that from an illegal into a legal space, I think is immense. Um, and if you compare that to, to other regions in the world, you know, we have a, a really, really good opportunity to make a, a thriving, successful industry that uh, can, can hold its head up high globally and internationally. Um, in terms of the usage, I always find this quite uh, amusing. Um, sadly, South Africa, uh, the, the Nigerians are, are higher consumers than anybody, but I guess they've got larger numbers. 
but you know, 50, almost 15 million people uh, consume cannabis on a regular basis in Nigeria. Again, the, the opportunity to, to sort of legitimize this whole industry is, is really substantial. And then for those of you who are new to the cannabis industry, I just want to quickly, quickly unpack the value chain. So cultivation, uh, often when people talk about getting into the cannabis industry, they, they, they talk about growing, whether, whether it's as a venture capitalist or investor, everybody looks at growing as the only thing in cannabis. But in order for the cannabis industry to come online, we need the whole value chain. So we want to unpack some of those things in this session. You know, extraction is important when you're actually taking the, the cannabinoids out of the uh, biomass and, and extracting into oil and other sort of mediums. Um, there's uh, the genetics. Genetics is a massive part of the industry. Testing. Uh, and then the sort of more peripheral stuff, you know, media, retail, uh, accessories, uh, ancillary services, whether it's security, whether it's courier companies, all of these things need to plug in to make this uh, a successful industry. And then we've, of course, got recreational and medicinal and industrial. Uh, and just for clarity, uh, recreational is for, 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 for uh, you know, sort of private adult use, um, adult responsible adult use. There's all kinds of uh, different phrases that are used. Medicinal is used for, for medicinal reasons, whether that's on an entry level, general anxiety, a bit of pain, or on a much more serious level, whether it's cancer, epilepsy, et cetera. Um, and then uh, there's industrial, um, industrial hemp, uh, which is a, a big buzz at the moment in terms of licenses that are on, on the cusp of being handed out. Um, but then industrial hemp also, you can grow CBD um, with, with industrial hemp as well. But the, the opportunity for industrial hemp uh, is, is huge as well. Um, but there are some barriers which we'll unpack in this session. So I think what I wanted to just uh, start with is, um, guys, I really want to just unpack the, 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 the strength. So where, where, are, where are our strengths as, as a nation? Sibs, maybe you could talk about that first. What are, our, what are the key things that we're doing really well already? Um, sure. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, um, mostly because of the fact that uh, if you look at South Africa's mm -hmm. cannabis industry, it, it hasn't um, it hasn't actually quite, let's say, left second gear uh, in terms of uh, the, the legislation and regulatory framework for it to really, um, you know, be a fledgling industry. There has been progress made, made to date um, and some very encouraging signs, which I think actually put South Africa amongst the top countries in the world in terms of um, uh, political will to develop and build the industry. Um, you know, so some of those are the, the Concord ruling in 2018 that made uh, private uh, growing and, and consumption of, of um, cannabis a human right uh, was uh, the, the rescheduling of um, THC and CBD, um, allowing for at least the beginning of a CBD market or cannabidiol market, which is one of the um, compounds within cannabis that isn't psychoactive. Um, and then the issuing of medical cannabis licenses. Um, I think to date there's about 29 licenses that have been issued. Um, around 200 app applicants applications um, and the hemp permits. So they've we've sort of had a, a little bit of a um, uh, a a mixed start, if you will. And some we 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 there certainly has been strong indications that we want this to be a priority uh, industry. Uh, but uh, the, um, but the frameworks around ensuring that it's a fledgling industry just aren't there as yet. Um, but you know, even with that being said, I think it's been very encouraging um, in terms of the uh, broad range of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs that are really going into this industry head first. Um, you know, I think uh, at, at Africa Cannabis Advisory Group, I think we're probably sitting on uh, something around 400 uh, business plans or applications for capital uh, over, over the last two years. It just shows the, the level of enthusiasm in this industry uh, in South Africa. Um, but just maybe very briefly to touch on kind of some of the natural strengths from a South African perspective in this industry. Number one is um, we, from an African perspective, we, we are well, we are very advanced in the way of infrastructure uh, that will allow, uh, that'll have, that'll um, enable the growth of this, uh, of this industry faster than other African countries. Um, we've got an extremely um, skilled and mature um, labor force, um, which includes uh, which includes, um, so, sorry, which includes uh, specialists in agri in the agri sector, the pharmaceutical sector, uh, the botanical sector, um, engineers, and all of these um, labors, uh, all of these um, skilled uh, laborers are going to be extremely important for uh, the development and growth uh, of this industry. And then, lastly, I would say that um, 
the natural base of foundation of this industry uh, is going to be, I think, on the agricultural side in terms of large scale production on the hemp side uh, and uh, sort of um, bespoke uh, sort of growing techniques on the medicinal side uh, and strains on the medicinal side and, and, and so forth. Thanks for that, Sibs. I think it's a very important point. You know, I mean, we, we often compare ourselves to when we, when we talk internationally, we're often looking at the Europeans and the Americans who have infrastructure. Um, so we don't have a competitive advantage there, but I, I guess certainly we do have a competitive advantage across, you know, continentally because of the infrastructure we can plug into. Um, Pierre, we're, we're quite well known internationally um, as a cannabis country. Um, is that a strength? Is that a weakness? And how did that happen? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic strength. You know, we've got, uh, we've got strong genetics. Durban poison is the one that's always mentioned. Um, so it's, it's built a name for, for Africa and cannabis and South Africa by association. So we've got a huge, we've got a very good reputation because of our history. Um, so our other strength is we've got a lot of farmers. We've got a lot of people who've been growing this crop for a long time. Unfortunately, they've been growing it in an illicit environment, which is not only destructive to them, but destructive to developing a proper industry. So one of our difficulties is going to be transitioning from the illicit market into the, into the, uh, the legal market. Um, but I think it's a huge opportunity. We've got lots of land. And amazingly, we've got lots of um, virgin land. We've got the best climate, if we talk Africa, and South Africa, we, you, you know, our light cycles are right. Um, cannabis loves Africa, so and we've got a lot of land. Um, COVID um, has actually boosted the, the economic sector. It's boosted the demand side in America. It was declared a, an essential crop. So um, eventually, um, cultivation is going to go. People use it very negatively, saying a race to the bottom. Um, I see it much more positively. Our competitive advantage is actually low cost production, but we should not only bank on that. We must do uh, beneficiation. We must do value add. Um, but one of our strengths is, is, is that the cost of business in South Africa is relatively low. And I'm not talking about labor. Uh, let's not get me wrong. We need to build a labor intensive industry because jobs are an issue in our country. Um, we've got a very well-developed um, economic environment. Our banking system is respected. We have double trade agreements, um, you know, tax agreements. We have uh, we respect it in the economic community, um, and I think that's a lot of comfort for a lot of people. Um, we've also got a strength in that we've got a good potential local market, and I think increasingly we need to change this narrative and talk about how do we play to our own strengths, how do we play to the local market. Um, we also very well positioned for in the export market. Um, we in the same timeline as Europe. We have strong ties to Europe, so that's another great strength. Um, I think I'll stop there. I've covered a couple. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure there's anything left for, for Brett or Tibor. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Brett. That's okay. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to add? So any other strengths we have? I mean, we. Yeah. I think one of our strengths is that we are we're quite a famous country, not for necessarily the best reasons, but we certainly are. Known, you know, we, we, we have a big flag that sticks out of the global map. Um, so people do do often look to us. Um, are there any other other things, Brett, maybe you want to jump in there? Any other things you want I'll, to add? I'll jump in and build up on what's on what the most obvious uh, strength that Africa has is that we are world class leaders in producing recreational adult use marijuana. By government's own estimations, the, the industry today is worth something like 28 million uh, rand, 28 billion rand. There are 3.5 million South African regular cannabis users. A certain amount is going to the local market, but most of it is going offshore yeah. and very little is actually finding its way back to the farmers who are producing the stuff. And I think one of the problems, uh, our biggest advantage is that we're so strong in, in terms of global branding as a, a recreational cannabis brand. And that at the same time speaks to our biggest weakness, which I won't go into, but it's something that government fails to conceptually grasp. And um, the other thing about our strengths, I think that I'd like to say is that Africa has a story to tell. And as Pierre would tell you, that is great for brand development. There's so many brands, cannabis brands that are waiting here to be developed once the right uh, uh, regulatory frameworks are in place. But um, we, we, we could be world leaders, not in just producing raw bud or, or hemp for export, but also a whole lot of African brands feeding into places like New York or the States, where there's going to be phenomenal um, uh, uh, consumer demand um, in the years ahead. So Africa is very, very well positioned on the world stage in terms 
terms of both what we have, although I don't think we're getting the full picture, but we're at a very exciting confluence of technology, agriculture, and health. And I think this is revolutionizing the societies across the world, and in particular, South Africa stands to gain particular advantage from this in a way that can spread the skills base, grow the economy, create more jobs and, add, and, and uh, spaces for entrepreneurs. Great, thanks for that, Brett. So, Tabaka, hopefully there's some input for you there after we've covered it all, but maybe just leading on from Brett in terms of the African story, and your, your brand is a very pro-African, an African brand, even the name is, it, it says what it does, you know, uh, the story, maybe you could expand on that and then any other input on the kind of strengths we have as a nation cannabis-wise. Look, I mean, um, adding to what uh, Brett has said and, and everybody else on the panel is that Af South Africa itself has an uh, extensive uh, amount of natural plant medicine that is attracted a whole lot of um, um, uh, companies all around the world coming here to come and investigate our medicinal capabilities. Hence, you know, your, 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 your example, some of the strains that come out of South Africa, which is the Ben Poison, which is very, very well known globally. Uh, even though um, for some reason, you know, our government hasn't initiated that, you know, uh, that we can protect that, that, that brand uh, as Devon Poison because it's, it belongs to us. So, but I think uh, the most uh, strength that we have is, is around those. And I think adding to what we are doing and in terms of making sure that these products are actually made here at home, uh, not just growing cannabis, sending, you know, um, uh, the biomass across to be extracted and back again and, 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 and made into product and back again into the country. So we're looking at a, uh, there's a huge opportunity and I think we are doing it. And I think a lot of the guys are actually jumping into it as well, where we are actually producing a product from, you know, uh, from scratch from home, because all this infrastructure is around. It's, we've got airports to be able to take the stuff out of the country easily. We've got ports that are international standards. So from a country point of view, we are ready to take over the world when it comes to South African brands. Um, and as you eloquently had said, Biomuti is, you know, it's exotic, especially into those areas in Europe, in the US. Uh, we are talking to distributors that side and they're very excited about just the fact that the name and it's coming from Africa, you know what I mean? It's got that flair and it looks great. So I think there's so much we can offer to the rest of the world. Um, we just need to get, you know, uh, uh, all the legislations and everything pointing to the right direction so that we can get this done. We're definitely going to touch on legislation, but uh, we're going to, we're going to get, get through a few more things first. Um, so the, the general consensus is uh, that we have a, a great infrastructure here, that we, you know, we have a, a global reputation. We are, I mean, the, the irony is we're all waiting for the cannabis industry to come online, but it already is online from an illegal perspective. You know, we are moving huge volumes. Um, so we have an infrastructure, but we don't necessarily have a cannabis infrastructure. So while those are, are, are weaknesses, um, I also see those as opportunities. So maybe we could just unpack, you know, for, for people on, the, on this webinar who are maybe interested in investing in the space or trying to figure out where they fit in, you know, outside of, you know, growing is obviously one thing, but if we can touch on some of the other different angles as well. Um, Pierre, what, what are some of the things that we need? to get moving here so that, you know, say legislation aside, if legislation all opened up tomorrow, um, what would be some of the things we need to make sure that we can bring it online? What are some of the infrastructure needs? What are some of the services needs? Sure. We could unpack some of those. Yes, so me, I'm just gonna very quickly summarize on what you alluded to earlier. Let's just say this, the value chain can be cultivation, processing, distribution, and consumer products and brands. Um, now, the question is, where are the opportunities in South Africa? Now, at Silverleaf, we look at, we look at the full value chain. There are opportunities way beyond cultivation. And in many senses, cultivation is actually quite high risk in the value chain. For example, Tobocco's uh, got a product, he's retailing. Uh, there's investment opportunities there. You've got an education institution, um, uh, Trenton. Um, there's an investment options there. Um, so I think as investors or businessmen, we mustn't only get stuck in cultivation. Um, but let's talk cultivation because a lot of people are focused on that. Again, you need to break down into the sectors or, or verticals. So there's cultivation for medical. Great. We've got a section 22.1 license. You apply to SAPRA. Barriers to entries are higher. So there's opportunities there. Hemp, we don't know. We don't have the legislation. Adult use, we know we're going to have to wait two years. 
the biggest opportunity for the country is probably in the adult use sector. And unfortunately, that's been put at the end of the queue for the, by the government, which um, we strongly disagree with. We should have that right at the top of the agenda. Um, but if you want to invest in hemp, um, you've got to get your timing right. Um, you can't plant hemp if you don't have processing. Um, so we need to start looking at the decortication factories. We need to look at second level processing so we can end up in products like biofuels or, or paper. Um, yeah, so, so the investment... Just, just, yeah, so just for those who don't understand what decortication is, can you just describe what that is quickly? And then also, you know, I believe it's super expensive to bring those plants online, but just give a bit of matrix to that. Yeah, so very briefly, um, if you cultivate cannabis and you want to get cannabinoids, you take it to an extraction plant. With, a, with hemp, it's a similar thing, except you take your product, um, you grow it, uh, and you take it to get the fiber, the best, the herd, and, and whatever your end goal is, seeds maybe. Um, but there's a second level step called retting where you actually have to leave it on the ground for a while. But let's not get stuck in the technical details. It's, it's to take a physical plant and turn it into a usable product. Um, so you would, you would decortic, uh, sorry, you first level process it, you create the fiber, you separate it, and then you do second level processing, for example, weaving, and then you take it into fabrication. Now, the problem with hemp is if you grow it and you don't have those factories, you're not going to be able to sell it. So that's a huge risk in the, in the well, industry. A risk, but also an opportunity for investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the last area is the ancillary services. You know, people spoke about mining. Uh, it's not the miners who made the money. It's the guys who sold the picks and the shovels. Um, so these are laboratories, testing stations, compliance, software, media, consulting, licensing. Um, so the abundance of opportunities and then retail, obviously, we need to get the doctors on board, we need dispensaries and we need to get products like Biomuti uh, sold by the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a question that came in, which kind of alludes to what I was going to ask Sib. So uh, what is the investment appetite from foreign investors into SA? So I'd like that, to, Sibs, if you could answer that question. Um, and, and, and also just if you could also highlight the kinds of uh, businesses and opportunities they're looking at. Um, sure. So it's it's a it's an interesting one because it's um, it's fluctuated over the last call it uh, three years or so uh, since uh, South Africa started to take steps to establish a legal industry. Um, so the first point, which I think is really important, is that the vast majority of international capital that's come into Africa for cannabis has gone to Lesotho. I think probably seventy or eighty percent even maybe closer to 90%. Um, that's for cultivation predominantly. Yeah, exactly. That's cultivation, but that's also processing, formulation, labs. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, broad in terms of the types of uh, deals that have gone into Lesotho, but primarily cultivation. Um, reason being that Lesotho's timing in terms of introducing uh, a licensing regime uh, dovetailed almost perfectly with um, um, with the emergence of a global cannabis industry uh, when Canada, uh, being the first G7 country to fully legalize cannabis, came online in 2018. Um, so by by our estimates, Lesotho attracted around 200 uh, and for me of of that size. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a massive um, shift in, in terms of um, investment and economic activity and growth. Um, South Africa, to some degree, I would say, has actually, uh, due to the pace that we had been moving, had missed out on it in terms of um, uh, political uh, sort of stability and, and so forth. Uh, South Africa would have been a much better investment uh, destination for those uh, uh, investors. Um, things have changed somewhat over the last uh, um, two years or so, yeah, a year, year or so. And what's really been happening is that the, the main driver of uh, investment into the um, African cannabis industry was actually uh, licensed producers or operators. Uh, in other words, cannabis companies looking to buy cultivation assets or uh, establish a brand uh, on the continent or uh, research, um, invest in research and development. What's happened over the last couple of um, last couple of years is that those uh, a lot of the leading or the largest uh, licensed producers and, and cannabis operators have actually been struggling uh, to meet uh, financial uh, projections and 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 so forth. And so, 
what's really uh, what's been the mega trend is that those uh, operators have started to focus on um, their home markets. Uh, so a good example of, of this is canopy growth, uh, which uh, is, um, you know, for a long time has been the largest cannabis uh, company uh, in the world by balance sheet. Uh, and canopy growth made a, um, a 28 million Canadian dollar investment into Lesotho uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2018, but they withdrew from Lesotho uh, last year. Uh, w with the view of focusing on the US and Canadian market and focusing on produce on developing brands for those markets. So there has been a shift uh, out of international or foreign uh, investors uh, appetite for Africa. It's still there, but it's much more uh, targeted. Um, and there's, uh, we're starting to see a trend of local investors beginning to uh, develop um, their ca uh, capacity and their allocations uh, for cannabis uh, projects. Um, it's a it's a slow transition in terms of the um, the local operate uh, the local uh, investors moving uh, into the space, and so it's kind of left uh, w uh, um, a capital deficit in the industry, and that's actually one of the biggest challenges uh, right now. Great, thanks for that, Subs. Um, to to Borco, so so there's you know there's international investment focusing you know predominantly on cultivation on putting plants in the ground. Um, from a retail perspective, because that's obviously your game. Do you do you see opportunity for for multiple brands to enter the space? Do you think it's cluttered? Do you think that we have a a, pop, a, a big enough pop, populace with buying power to buy product? Um, what is your perspective on the opportunity for people on this webinar in the retail space? Uh, thanks, Trent. And I think um, from a retail point of view, what we see is that um, there, there's a lot of products. Um, it's just a question of quality of products in the market and in making sure that uh, what's been presented um, um, or what, what's been written on a bottle, it is what's inside the packaging. Um, and I think that's where um, the, the challenge will probably come in where, you know, uh, and again, um, being able to understand the difference between or consumers understand the difference between isolate products and broad spectrum products because the current legislation is really forcing uh, the, kind of, uh, the, the CBD manufacturers to, to, to look at the isolate more so than to look at the, 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 the full spectrum or the broad spectrum. Now, what do I mean by that? A, a cannabis plant, when you do a full extraction, you get all the different cannabinoids, including THC. Now, if hemp is grown with the lesser THC, it means that it could be prevalent in there, but it won't be as high as, as if it's a single, if it's a, um, a high THC plant. Now, um, if you're gonna be making a medicine out of that, that's going to be sold, um, the chances are that that's gonna be much more better use and has much better um, traction from a user point of view, because of course it's a full spectrum, so you use less. Now, when you're looking at an isolated product, you have to use more. And I think a lot of that has to do with education. Um, more and more people that have, that have bought products in your large retailers like your clicks and discount, they don't come back to, to buy again, especially because what they buy doesn't, it doesn't translate to uh, efficacy for them. So therefore, they don't see a reason to use it. And this is the issue where we think that the legislation as it is, it limits um, you know, the, the amount of CBD. We know that it's safe up to 800 milligram a day. So it doesn't make any sense that we're gonna have a situation where it is sitting at 20 milligram. Because then somebody that has chronic pain, how are you gonna deal with that uh, with 20 milligram? It's not enough. So I think uh, with the retail is concerned, there's a huge opportunity. There is no such thing as too many products. Because if you look at paracetamol, you go to clicks and discam, um, how many different brands of paracetamols are there? How many different brands of aspirins are there? How many different brands of cough syrups are there? So there's a huge opportunity in that, that there's more space for a lot of people to play. But we need to increase that dosage per day to be at least international standard, not this uh, little joke that we have, which makes it very, very difficult for us to minimize. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's certainly a challenge. But I think the general consensus there is that um, there is definitely a market for more retail brands in the space, but uh, there are some limitations in terms of legislation. Brett, you, you're right. in, a, in, a, in a fortunate position, thanks to the Waffle, that you, you, you have a very bird's eye view on the industry. You, know, you, you see every aspect and every angle of the industry. What, what is, in your opinion, are some of the opportunities for, for growth for, for South Africans in cannabis at the moment? Well, 
I think that um, just before I go into that, what's very interesting, just uh, following up on what's been talked about so far, is a, is a, a dipstick into where uh, cannabis is in terms of the mainstream economy, in terms of an overview. And um, from, yeah, from the bird's eye view, the two JSE listed companies that are cannabis players, that's Labatt and Nutritional Holdings, are both in fairly serious trouble at the moment because they haven't followed through, uh, been able to follow through on funding and uh, revenue projections. Um, Labatt is in danger of uh, losing its listing if it doesn't post its financial year end results by the end of this month. And Nutri Hold is suspended because it's had uh, various cryptocurrency issues and is under investigation there. But that doesn't mean that the that big business isn't looking at the um, uh, isn't looking at the um, at the at the market. And if you had to say where where is the the the, the real market, I'd say follow Johan Rupert and Distel. They have seen that the future uh, of um, of, of cannabis products is lies very heavily in edibles and beverages. Distel and um, the Rupert family uh, uh, venture capital arm picked up a substantial stake, and I think it was True Leaf, the the um, uh, no Relief, the the Cape Town uh, company, yeah. and um, Distel has got Durban Poison, the the, the brewery brand. There, so I think that you can see in the in in, in the coming months the formation of uh, the sort of South African breweries, as it were, of cannabis products coming out, and the opportunities will really be like craft. Uh, breweries or artisanal uh, brands that will that will come up around there. Otherwise, it's a multinationals game right now. The costs, uh, the, the barriers to entry are exceptionally high, and there are all sorts of dangers that are that are attached to that. Unless we work out a proper regulatory framework that is inclusive of as many people as possible. But at the moment, uh, despite government's good intentions, the cannabis reform um, uh, spirit isn't quite translating into economic opportunities, except for those with deep pockets and their eyes on the longer term horizon. So it's very frustrating for middle level entrepreneurs to right now, in the absence of a proper legal framework to know where to invest their money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to, Pierre, I just want to ask you some questions. So, you know, on the back of that uh, input, Brett, thank you for that, you know, you know for, 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 the, for the viewers, you know, hearing that the two listed cannabis co companies in this country are, are, are potentially in trouble uh, is, is worrying, you know. Um, but I think the, the caveat to that is that, yes, we have our challenges, um, and I'm just trying to be positive from people who want to get into the industry, but also realistic, is we just need to look at global trends. It's as simple as that. Cannabis that's is it. only going one way, and that's forward. So the, the quicker we embrace that and the quicker we work through these uh, these challenges we have, um, the sooner we'll get there. From, from, Trent, from a, sorry, if I, yes. Trent, if I could just chip in there just to finish the, the, the narrative earlier. And, you know, the, the two listed companies are in trouble, but that's not necessarily because... Uh, they're pursuing the wrong strategy. It might be a timing thing, they're overseas yeah. regulatory hurdles. And it wouldn't be fair to, to talk about big business without looking at the emergence of our own local giant, which is this amazing merger between Goodleaf, uh, the, the, the CBD consumer brand that's looking to go global, and Highlands Investments, which is a leader in, in cultivation and processing in Lesotho. Now, if we're looking at crafting our own multinationals or giants, that's quite an inspirational story because that's come out of a merger out of you know, the ashes of canopy growth, as you're talking about earlier, um, that, that, that's rising out of that. So the process is going through quite a, a, a traumatic space and the opportunities are going to be opening up and closing down in sort of unforeseen ways over the next 18 months at least. Absolutely. Um, Pierre, you know, you, you, with, with Silverleaf, you know, um, so you're doing some great work in terms of trying to build investor confidence. Um, I think, you know, one of the barriers to entry is confidence. You know, we, we, we all know that there are investors out there that are eager to invest in the cannabis space. Um, what are the sort of narratives that you get from potential investors and what are the challenges you face in, 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 in making sure that people do understand this is an opportunity? But I think what's also important to understand is this is not a quick money making scheme. You know, you've got to be in this for the long run and it take, it's going to take time for it to come online. What are some of the conversations you're having and what are some of the sort of narratives that you you have at the moment with the potential investors? Yeah, thanks, Trent. And so, so again, we live in this dichotomy. You know, I can sit here and, and roll out plus 60 doubling figures. The growth figures are phenomenal. So um, on the one hand, we have to sell our industry as opposed to sell our investment fund 
because people don't know enough about the industry. And it's quite an easy sell. It's the fastest growing industry in the world. It's exploding. We've had all these, uh, these harvests was bought out for $2.1 billion, GW by $7.2 billion. You know, there's a, there's a great story there. So on the one hand, the investment managers, the money, people, the suits, uh, it's an it's a asset class that they, they very soon cannot afford not to be in. So it's, it's a really good environment on the one hand. On the other hand, we've got the pump and dump guys in, in, uh, in Canada. You know, two years ago, it, uh, the, the index went through the roof. Uh, canopy growth was worth $10 billion. And a year later, um, it was a bit of mayhem. And, and, and I think that's, that, that didn't do the, the global trade any good, but we back on it. We've had 40% growth this year in the indices. So it's looking good. So we back on it. Let's talk South Africa. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people who wanted to invest in South Africa ultimately invested in Lesotho. Um, and they created a narrative that said, um, don't invest in South Africa, it's a regulatory mess. Uh, and I'm up against that all the time. Um, and quite frankly, it's very hard to, uh, to, to argue differently. Um, I know of people who invest in money, they spent two years applying for a license, they abandoned their operation. So there, there, there's some bad stories. That said, um, as Silverleaf, we 100% believe the time is right. If you want to make money, and we, our job is to take money from people invested in the in, in the sector and provide a superior return. I, I think that the time couldn't be better right now. We're at the bottom of the growth, growth curve. Um, we're on the radar, as Sibs alluded to. Nobody in cannabis is not looking at South Africa. Let me tell you, they're watching us like a hawk. Yeah. Uh, so the money, the foreign investment will come in. Uh, our own market at the beginning, we could have a hemp permit industry that gets created within two months. Um, so I think it's a fantastic time. But the perception is what's changed. And what has changed is we now have a master plan. We now have political will. We've had a whole slew of, of webinars this week talking about it, uh, provincial level, national level. So I think we're in a very, very good position now. Uh, but we are coming from a negative narrative and we have to undo it. Yeah, absolutely. To Boko, just, just leading on from that, you know, as a, as a retail brand, how important do you think it is that as an industry, we self-regulate and we manage ourselves and we do things properly to build that confidence? 100%. I think, um, hence, we went uh, together with uh, fellow competitors to form Cannabis Trade Association Africa. Uh, and the reason behind that was to um, self-regulate, make sure that what's written on a pack um, of our packaging is what's inside, number one, and that the products are made uh, in a proper facility, preferably uh, GMP and so forth and so on. Uh, from the regulatory point of view, and making sure that everybody here is, um, um, is, um, um, is uh, uh, you know, in tune with what we're trying to achieve. Now, that same can be said with uh, our ability to be able to lobby uh, because that CTAA is created for that particular reason. One is to self-regulate amongst everybody else to say, guys, let's make sure that what we put the product out there is as best as possible, what's written on the label is correct. And then the second part is to lobby the government for some of these regulations that needs to be then you know, made conducive and favorable, favor favorable for, 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 for businesses to come in. And third, of course, is to try and push, you know, the, the regulator like SAPA to be able to, you know, open up the market in terms of opening up the amount of dosages out there. As we speak, um, according to SAPA, uh, products that are into water, products that are, that are into gummies, products that are into tea, products that are, that are into honey are literally illegal, according to that, because there's no legislation that governs medicine inside Food products. So those are the things that needs to change in order for us to streamline the business to, so that it can actually, you know, we can see the, the real value that's coming out of that going forward. Yeah, no, I agree. I think self-regulation is, is important in any sunrise industry, especially coming out of a prohibition sort of space. Sibs, uh, just, just quickly, can we touch on some of the other businesses that are needed to make sure this industry comes online? So, so, so we, you know, we all talk about the growing and but what, what else do we need infrastructurally? You know, what other kinds of businesses do we need? And where are those opportunities for people uh, to, to join? 
Um, sure. So there's uh, there's a whole host of uh, sort of areas uh, where expertise and and sort of new uh, businesses are required to help support the the growth of the the industry. Um, maybe I'll I'll kick off uh, sort of around sort of the cultivation uh, space just to maybe um, look at a couple of um, uh, of of sort of real industry needs. Um, number one, uh, I'd say that uh, there's there's a, there's a, a need for an expansion in terms of uh, really understanding the different types of genetics uh, within the space um, and uh, mapping out how and where uh, these genetics can be applied to um, uh, sort of growing processes, uh, to sort of climate uh, and so forth. So there's there's almost a um, uh, a level of development that has to happen around that very early stage of that cultivation process in terms of um, uh, expertise, I, uh, IP, registration of that IP, um, and uh, sort of calibrating growing techniques and methods uh, and so forth for our environment uh, in, the, uh, in the global context. Um, number two, in, in the way of uh, compliance in, in, uh, around uh, cultivation, particularly in medical cannabis, uh, we, we have a need uh, to continue to improve on the technology that allows us to um, track uh, and, and trace uh, the, uh, the cultivation process uh, that can sort of uh, improve the growing uh, 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 sort of outcomes and yield uh, in these operations um, and uh, improve efficiency. So uh, technology around lighting, around HVAC uh, and so forth. There's a need to continue to improve um, uh, you know, um, our output uh, from, from that perspective. Um, there is also, I think, a significant uh, need um, to, uh, if we think about thinking about medical cannabis uh, around uh, testing and, and laboratories and, and, and sort of uh, formulation capabilities and research capabilities uh, around uh, sort of end products. You know, the one of the, the major challenges that we see in the industry is that um, the local labs haven't uh, uh, aren't actually. Um, at, at a, at a comp competitive or comparable level or, compar or comprehensive level relative to international labs. So there's a, a deficit in terms of a high quality testing um, of um, cannabis um, uh, products, which uh, sort of puts South Africa at a disadvantage because, you know, cultivators now have to ship product to the Netherlands and uh, or other parts of the world and pay thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, whereas that's that's something that we would really um, benefit from as as a local uh, industry. Um, and I think with that is uh, sort of this research and development aspect of things. You know, we um, we we are very enthusiastic about growing and cultivation, but the the need to understand how we can formulate a certain um, uh, end products to meet certain needs, whether it's medicinal wellness uh, and so forth, is key. I think Brett touched on a, on a really important uh, point around, uh, you know, the um, the style rethink thesis of saying that, you know, they wanted to invest in a company that, uh, in some ways, could help illustrate uh, or, or could help highlight uh, a broader theme, which is around um, how cannabis can help affect mood. Um, in, in in a sense, right? Um, and so there has to be a lot of research. Uh, um, uh, capacity and funding, both from private and public sector, in in our context, in order for us to be uh, competitive. Otherwise, the risk is that we end up being very, very good growers, and everything else in terms of further processing, uh, IP happens in uh, in the in Europe and uh, in the US. And so that's where you know, kind of strategy and collaboration becomes so much uh, more important if we want to have an industry that's competitive over over a very um, over a sustained period of time. Yeah, I, I agree totally. We need to we need to build that capacity out. Brett, you know, you're in you're in the media space in cannabis, which is, I mean, to some degree, an ancillary service. Um, what other ancillary services do you think in terms of where the opportunities are? I think starting off the fact that we we are primarily in the cultivation and primary producer market. I think the initial things will become in uh, packaging, uh, especially around compliance. Um, we're going to, there's going to be some work in developing standard units, I suppose, for exports. And as we start working together with, um, with other, the, the eight other countries that have legalized cannabis for exports, I think there's going to be a lot more collaboration around um, 
African supplies going into Europe. And I think that uh, from an African continent perspective, I think the packaging and especially around the safety elements of that uh, mixed in with compliance and those kind of services will be, uh, you know, very specialist and niche, but that's where the immediate opportunities are. And I think in media, in education, in getting the word out there, because there's a lot of stigma that's still attached to the cannabis industry. There are a lot of um, conservative uh, uh, elements in society who would tend towards authoritarianism and blame uh, social evils and uh, you know on drug consumption and lumping cannabis in with the likes of hard drugs like um, uh, you know c cocaine etc. But I think that the, the all of this is uh, all of these opportunities lie there. But the biggest single challenge right now, as I'm seeing it and it's highlighted this week, is the absence of the voices of the police force and the justice department in the reform initiative. There's not one webinar that I've attended where either representatives from those um, two departments have attended. And the onslaught against cannabis users, particularly people who are marginalized, who are poor, who live in the trans sky, who can't afford lawyers, is continuing. And this has um, very dangerous uh, antecedents or whatever the word, right word is for cannabis reform in this country because it could uh, it could as much as it could be a unifying post-COVID economic recovery um, vehicle it could also lead to racial division and increased inequality and uh, raise a whole lot of equity issues that we see uh, in the in the in the first world cannabis markets. Yeah, th thanks for that, Brett. I mean, just just for 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 the viewers out there, just to clarify, as a cannabis industry. Um, there is a lot of frustration around legislation, around the regulators at the moment. We're not going to unpack that in this session, um, but we are working very hard together as an industry and also, um, you know, trying to work with as many uh, government officials as possible to try and move this forward. But it is certainly a, a common theme in many discussions at the moment. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. I want to take a few questions. Um, uh, Grant Mabasa is asking, if I'm willing to invest as little as, say, 2,000 Rand a month, where would be the best sector to invest and get a return? Uh, are there opportunities to sort of micro invest like that? And uh, where would uh, where would that person start? Pierre, um, do you want to that or Sibs? Either of you? Yeah, guys? I can take that. Um, look, I think everybody um, needs to consider investing in this industry. Not only is it going to be a great return, but we in, in investing in the stuff Brett was referring to. We need to create a new kind of industry with different frameworks with a sharing culture, we need to be sensitive to the economy, that kind of stuff. We need to start at the bottom, grow from the bottom. If we don't include small farmers, we're not going to have a successful industry. So what we did when we created Soil Belief was to actually provide a managed solution for people who want to invest. Um, the barrier to entry was quite high in our initial raise, but we are looking at crowdfunding options. Uh, and we think there's a huge market, particularly amongst the youth. They don't have to be convinced about cannabis. They are very supportive. So um, you will see it, watch your space, um, crowdfunding, uh, allowing access for small investors into the industry will definitely be something that's that's coming. Great. Thanks, Pierre. Sibs, any input on that? Um, so I'd say that, uh, so there's two uh, avenues of investment. I think if you're talking about that quantum, the first one is investing in your education. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's, we've got a long time in terms of the development of this industry. We still, you know, very, very early uh, in, in, uh, uh, in sort of the establishment of, of a proper legal uh, uh, industry. So um, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to invest in, in your education, understanding the industry, getting books, getting, you know, setting up for courses. There's Chiba. Really try, try to understand the nuts and bolts of how this industry works, because that's going to allow you to make better investment decisions um, further down the line, instead of perhaps being a little bit more speculative um, in your in your early sort of investment activities. Number two, I'd say um, um, I'd say they, they are options to invest in listed international cannabis companies. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, a number of uh, listed U.S. companies. There's a number of listed Canadian companies. It's it is a bit of a minefield be, uh, for for reasons discussed previously in terms of uh, you know how the industry was initially set up with a little bit more of a cowboy approach. But there are uh, uh, companies that are emerging as uh, you know very very solid uh, performers, very good at executing, uh, and uh, and that would be and and those would be quite a, a relatively safe bet on a broad. Uh, cannabis uh, thesis. Um, with time, I think Piers touched on this and so forth, but I think there's going to be uh, a, a number of um, 
investment uh, opportunities, uh, you know, that can start as, as, as little as a thousand or two thousand rand um, that are going to, you know, begin to become available in the South African market. But you almost want to have a little bit of time to actually feel that you understand the nuts and bolts of the industry so that when those local opportunities are there, you have a much higher conviction and belief in sort of how and where you should be playing. Yeah, great. Agreed. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Brett, I'm going to ask you this. Um, no, no, uh, if you can't answer it, don't don't, don't worry. Um, wouldn't uh, so this is from Sinki uh, Makubu? Wouldn't blockchain tech help with tracking the cultivation process? And I mean, I guess blockchain in general would it help the industry in terms of transparency? Um, I think, as someone who's not completely informed on the subject, I'd say the answer is yes, mm -hmm. because there's something that's very interesting. And Pierre, you'd probably be more uh, more adept at this than I am, but there's something very interesting in the development of cryptocurrencies internationally and the cannabis, um, the development of cannabis. And I think there are new forms of funding or financing, or ways of of uh, storing value or tracking authenticity. Um, but I'm not uh, technologically adept enough to be able to answer that uh, that properly. But, but principally, you think it's a good idea? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. But I mean, within who, who knows uh, what the value in cryptocurrencies are? It's a very volatile uh, market at the moment. But what mm. what uh, given the absence of tra um, traditional banks' involvement in the cannabis industry, particularly in the states where they're prevented uh, because it's illegal still at a federal level, the traditional banking system cannot really get involved uh, in the cannabis industry. And it remains to be seen how that pans out in Africa. But uh, there well could be this, uh, this rise between the African cryptocurrency and cannabis uh, development. Yeah, great, so, thanks for that. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time to walk a quick one for you. Um, I know you mentioned this earlier, this is from Martin Cunningham. Do we uh, then find ourselves in the same situation with exporting our natural resources and re-importing them? You touched on that briefly. How do we get around that? Well, I think we need to build industries here at home uh, as we are doing it. We need to make sure that we are manufacturing these products, adding value to it, beneficiation, as you said. In that way, you have a finished product that will go to you know, international community as a finished product in a box already labeled to a German language or French or Spanish or whatever it is, even Chinese for that matter. But the main important thing is that if we don't build these capabilities and capacity, then we'll have the same situation we've had with diamonds, the same situation we had with gold. As we speak today, there is absolutely no direction regarding beneficiation of those because it's an afterthought. So here we're saying we're doing it from scratch. And this is something that was very close to my heart because we have a high unemployment rate in this country. So it will make sense that we should not allow any of these products to be shipped out like they were doing it with gold and diamond. We need to add value to it. And we have capacity and manufacturing facilities here that can do the same. So I think that's where the focus should be as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely great. So listen, we're running out of time. There's one question I'll ask. So someone asked, uh, Leanne Rimmer asked where they can learn relevant courses on cannabis. Uh, so shame there you are. Uh, Cheaper <laughs> Cannabis Academy. Um, there are lots of courses on there, cheaperafrica.com. Take a look at those. In the last minute, I just want you all to give me one or two words, maybe three, but no more than three words of what you think is in store for this industry. Uh, Siv, let's start with you. Um, growth, uh, impact, and, um, uh, and high, 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 higher, higher consciousness. <laughs> Beautiful. I like it. Brett, put on the spot there. You? <laughs> uh, you're on mute, Brett. You're on mute. We're, we're in for a pair of rock and roll. Three words. That's, that's yep, really... rock and roll. Okay, I like it, Pierre. Yeah, bring the money. Africa loves cannabis and we can change our country for the better. Great. Tobacco. Open the legislation, let the business grow. Let us make products that will be exported to the rest of the world. Let's take South Africa to the rest of the world. Absolutely. Uh, my, part, my parting shot and my word is collaboration. We need to work together. The pie is big enough and we need to work together. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks to Gib for co-hosting this with us and to Coop. Um, mm. Some amazing stuff. The industry is super exciting. Yes, it's got its challenges. But uh, it's one of the most exciting industries in the world. And it's only going from strength to strength. So any of you watching out there that are interested in investing, please uh, you know, speak to some of these guys and uh, consider it as an opportunity. A long, a long game. It's not going to happen overnight. But we are 
working hard and there is certainly going to be a booming industry in the next few years. Um, from Azuchiba Africa, have an awesome afternoon. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. Thank you.